Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's start with the <coughs> most uh, awaited uh, vitro retina surgical session number two. What went wrong? Video based complication session. Uh, yeah, I request the vice counsel to come and accompany us on the stage. Dr. Saurav Sina, please. Dr. Lunga Gopal, sir. Dr. Manish Nagpal. Dr. Veera Sarvanan is already here. Dr. Cyrus Shroff, sir. And uh, we'll be joining. Uh, live virtually by Dr. Hani Hamza. I call upon the first speaker, what's in the box, Dr. Guru Prasad Ayachis, sir. We will be having three minutes of video presentation followed by a discussion from our wise counsel and maybe one or two questions from the audience if possible. Over to Dr. Guru Prasad, sir. Can I have the slides of Dr. Guru Prasad, please? TV team. Here. Uh, thanks, VRSI, for this opportunity. So, uh, my story is of a 38 year old gentleman who had trauma to his right eye 10 years ago, and uh, he was not very certain about mode of injury and was very vague in the history. He had blurred vision in the right eye since five to six years and he didn't seem to bother about it. No systemic illnesses were found. Anti-segment was uh, unremarkable. Uh, vision was very low though. There was uh, there were cells in the antechamber and uh, there was a PSE cataract and then he no view of the fundus. The ultrasound B scan <coughs> of, the, of the eye showed total retinal detachment with stiff, bold, nasally. And he was posted for uh, right eye synecolysis plus cataract extraction plus retinal detachment surgery. So this is a surgery in progress. So it was a uh, bad detachment and there was this incarceration which had to be uh, released by retinectomy. And then uh, the usual steps of PVR surgery were adopted. Nothing uh, special about this, just to show you what we did. And then uh, two months later, the redetachment, redetachment occurred with lifted retinectomy edges, which was again, attended to by another surgery by then the pupil was bound down again and he had to be uh, use, uh, iris hooks had to be used so again surgery and at this point of time we saw that there was something in the box that's why i i was i recollected this um, movie clip from the movie seven and uh, that was the foreign body which we had missed during the first surgery was removed and the retinal detachment was was attended to and you can see that the retina there is looking lifeless the nasal retina is looking lifeless because it is siderotic uh, it was uh, it needed a very elaborate surgery with more retinectomies and laser and oil injection but then you know what happens in pvrs there is always a return of pvr and this again had to be reoperated with multiple uh, membrane bling and there it is for you how difficult it is when when you reoperate the second time the membranes are even denser and then was um, managed and set, uh, reattached so the running points from this for us was a uh, pre-operative workup was probably efficient uh, a thorough b scan and a ct of the orbit was probably more important than just a clinical examination with the foreign body completely in the first surgery probably because of the long duration of the uh, history of this patient uh, IOFP can be hidden subretinally, especially in incarcerated retina and retraction. So, uh, and we missed that sidrotic appearance, which probably was there during the first surgery also. Uh, and it was looking lifeless. When we tried the second time, it was looking lifeless, uh, almost a dead, a dead retina. Uh, we should have suspected foreign body at, at least then. And uh, so this, the message is look inside the box in eyes with trauma, search every nook and corner of the eye. So the question for the panel is, uh, the vice counsel is, has anyone had a similar what's in the box experience? Thank you very much, sir, uh, for the uh, wonderful case. Uh, 
before we go to the panel, I just want to know this surgery was recorded on 3D visualization system. Yes. The, sex, the second surgery. Right. Yeah? yeah. So I think we'll add one question to that also whether it offers any further advantage as compared to our conventional okay. system. Maybe we have comment from Dr. Cyrus, sir. When we, I mean, looking inside is a later stage, but when we took the history of the patient, did we? Uh, no, what trauma he had uh, had. No, uh, I think uh, I alluded to that point in the beginning that he was very vague about. Didn't give a proper. He just said some trauma. He didn't tell the nature of the trauma. That was a long, uh, you know, uh, trauma that had occurred ten years ago. He had forgotten himself. I don't know whether this sort of tells us that in such a situation when there is a history of trauma and uh, which has led to uh, this complex situation in the eye, whether we should do uh, an X-ray or maybe even a, a CT prior to undergoing this, because that would have possibly picked up the foreign right. body also. So probably we should uh, do a imaging in all cases of trauma, because I had another case just two months following this, where uh, there was a small foreign body in a, in a uh, child again, which was four, four to five years old, uh, penetrating trauma uh, which with RD and in the second surgery we found a, there was a small uh, of muck or you can say a stone particle inside the eye probably would have gone inside with contaminated stick so that is another experience I had recently so in all even if it is a penetrating injury without uh, history of the uh, typical history of the metal on metal activity I think we should do imaging. Maybe you have a comment from Lingam Gopal, sir. Not much to add because he's already and answers himself. So, uh, I would only think that the, when the B scan is done, whoever is doing it, because it's important that we train our fellows or residents on how to do B scan, not to just image the posterior pole and come out and say retina is on or off, but to image all the way to the periphery by tilting the probe so that you can pick up any peripheral. I'm sure this foreign body would have been picked up if the B scan was done properly. I think it's not a question of uh, it being missed, it's missed because scan was not done properly. I agree, sir. I'd like to add that the, this, as you pointed out, more common these missed foreign bodies in plant matter, especially thorns. A lot of times we see that uh, endophthalmitis comes with the endophthalmitis, ultrasound is not done properly, or it can, echo can come in a linear direction, where the thorn is in perpendicular axis, easily missed also. A lot of times I feel the thorns are the missed foreign bodies because of the media opacity infection as well as the ultrasound. It, it, unless you go in the long axis, the echo, 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 echo will be very small and very subtle, so it can be easily missed. So foreign bodies, I have had one case where they came with the, in by my senior in earlier days and 10 years back he came with a cirrhosis. Not an RD, but again it was missed by ultrasound. At that time ultrasound was done, but probably lack of application. History taking is very important here, could have given a little bit more importance to how he got really, that's one of the critical points to identify what to expect inside this the patient area. didn't remember and he didn't seem to bother about his bore vision, he just mm -hmm. came for a casual go shopping. To add to what uh, both sides said, uh, again keep our minds open to use UBM if necessary, especially in these horn cases, if you have something in the back of your mind, UBM helps us pick up once in this small uh, pencil lead inside, I've had a case with or maybe do an EUP and this 20 years back. And what, what cases would you like to do? For? Lead, the, the kids playing in the classroom, lead pencil, lead was stuck was just behind. A very clean eye, still there was some end off and we couldn't see what was happening and there was a small less. So UBM there helped horn patients. Again, just keeping, not right. specific to your case, right. UBM sometimes gives us a better idea also. Also, we'd like to point out that in the presence of cirrhosis, it doesn't always, uh, it may not always be possible for you to identify the original foreign body. The reason is that it degrades over a period of time. If the original foreign body was very small, you may actually find a crumbling of the iron particles there, but no foreign body can pick up and take it out. Sometimes this is not uncommon if you somebody comes to eight years, nine years after the injury, you find the entire retina is cirrhotic. You really look for foreign body, you can't take out an actual foreign body. It's also possible. Even metallic foreign bodies can sometimes be de demagnetized by addition and uh, degradation. Loss of ferrous component. Yes, please. Raji, please. Raji, one second. One second, one second.
talking about the blast, whenever you had an injury, blast injury, there are multiple tiny foreign bodies you tend to miss. Definitely make sure that you search for all those things. Or was talking about you, a UBM is definitely an indicator. And whenever you are not sure about the type of trauma, you're sure about what the okay. type of trauma, then it's fine. But if you want them getting a body stuck angle sometimes, then foreign body stuck angle, as foreign body, put it after years. Stuck there, all corneal edema in the raised area. And we look for it. So you're saying that when the history is not clear, it is the way you do the entire battery of investigations and imaging. Workup, uh, that is what the emphasis is on the workup. Maybe have the second part of the question as well. No problem. Scan which you did. Normally what happens is no, no, people no. do. You didn't do. You didn't do it. You would suggest that in all trauma cases, a CT scan with one mm section. What happens is, A, CT scan is not done. E when it's done, it's done with 5 millimeter sections. 5 millimeter sections guaranteed to miss all small foreign bodies. 1 millimeter sections you will never miss. And the, I personally find that ultrasound is very dependent on the observer. But it is scan, you are virtually sure what you are de dealing with if there is a foreign body. Right. We have a couple of more comments. Uh, yeah, I mean what uh, you alluded to and uh, Ajeev alluded to is all okay when we are suspecting a foreign body, but we are not finding the foreign body. Here, what Guru Prasad had was is a very vague history of injury. Patient never suspected an intraocular foreign body in the first place. Correct. That was a that was a that was the problem. And the whoever did fellow did or resident did, he found an RD was very happy. I found an RD on B scan. That's it. You no, know, that's why I'm doing a B scan to find an RD. He was not looking for a foreign body. This, the learning lesson here is even in a patient with a funnel shaped RD. Don't stop there, like Paul said. To the front, look for a foreign body with the history of vague injury. Otherwise, I don't think I would have ordered a CT scan or a UBM in this patient. The very vague history of trauma because we're not suspecting an intraocular foreign. Maybe we have a comment from Muna, ma'am. Just wanted to make a comment. Even if you don't have a CT, even if you don't have a U, probably an eye with a closed funnel or a narrow funnel, where the is highly elevated. Just a little more gel to the standoff effect. The contrary to what we always think is we miss small foreign bodies. It's equally difficult. It's equally easy. In fact, easier to miss a very large foreign body, especially if it's in the anterior chamber, anterior segment, and if it is old, because there are no interfaces because it is so big. So we tend to miss it. In five minutes both ways. It Nice point, madam. Uh, maybe you have, we have one last uh, question from the audience side. Uh, what's the best radiological investigation if you suspect a glass intraocular foreign body, also wooden foreign body? In the sense they want to ask when you will do a CT scan and when we will advise an MRI scan. Ultrasound is best for any type of foreign body, whether it is glass or wood, metal. CT hey, for metal. sir, you like to ask? Not picked up easily by MRI. Produce scan. Scan. Glass has some amount of lead in it, so it will be picked up by CT scan, no problem at all. But all CT scan is quite good. MRI is more useful when you want to relate the soft tissue injury as well as foreign body's relationship to the retina and sclera and etc. etc. Yes, we are looking at foreign body, CT is the best. Okay, I think we had a very good discussion. Thank you, Guru Prasad sir, for bringing up uh, this challenging case. Uh, may we have Dr. Rajiv Reddy, please? With us, he will be talking to us on broken uh, uh, frag removal. Good afternoon. Thank you, VRSI, for giving me this opportunity to share our experiences for the surgery. Uh, we all know that vitreoretinal surgery is, we are used to it, but sometimes it can throw uh, difficult situations which uh, don't know what to do. So one of the situations what we really deal with is uh, microcornea with a cataract which is a hard nucleus and these are the difficult cataracts to remove. When I saw this patient in my list I was feeling okay, okay I'm going to be uh, in for a tough time uh, because I know that I can't just remove this lens uh, otherwise and uh, 
I know that I need to use a pragmatome and because of the microcornea, I'll have a difficulty in visualizing the peripheral retina and have an increased risk of retinal detachment because of coloboma and all this are the problems which I was facing. I was feeling bad, okay, this is a bad case for me to do, but I don't have an option because he's a one-eyed patient and that's the only eye which is surviving on and had a poor vision in that eye. He was being referred to me to do it, so sometimes uh, the perks of being a VR surgeon. Then we went ahead, started doing surgery, we started using a frag. I know that it's not going to be removed with a letter. To see that uh, the view is moving, shifting, that's basically because of our uh, instruments which are close to the cornea. Whenever I'm doing anything, it's actually getting shifted. To see what happened. So little did I knew that I'm going to encounter something like this. That's a phragmotome which is broken inside vitreous cavity. And then I felt lucky. I was feeling good that it was a colobomatous eye and I could, I don't have to do worry much about anything because if it would have been a regular normal retina, we would have actually caused a damage to the retina. It went and hit the colobomatous area and I did not have to worry much about it. So that's when, when you feel sometimes it's blessing in disguise. I could actually go with uh, forceps, a hold of that in the colobomatous area and got it out through the sclerotomy which I had made. You can see this same phragmotome which has gone through the same sclerotomy which we have made uh, would not actually come out easily through it because of uh, ragged edges. I had to enlarge the sclerotomy a little with the VR blade and then uh, pull it out by using the forceps. So that's actually the pragmatome coming out. It has gone in and it has broken out. And fortunately for me, this patient regained vision and uh, was having 20 to 50 vision on the first post of day. So I was feeling happy that I, though I had a problem and I was lucky to get away with it, but I still don't have an answer to why it actually broke. We, I can get some input from others. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for bringing up this uh, interesting case. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the rarest of the rare complications, but uh, managed so very beautifully. Uh, may I just like to confirm whether Dr. Hani Hamza has joined us virtually? I don't think so. The AV team is not joined. Okay. That's what the AV team has to check. Okay. We'll start with Dr. Sarvanan, sir. It's like uh, when you look at the anterior segment surgeons, they use the anterior vitrectomy for PC run cases. They hardly change it. As the nurse, when was this first open, they said it's almost a tooth, just the same cutter we are using. It happens in red. First, uh, change the FECO tip. I think it's an overused FECO tip. Like they don't change their vitrectomy, we don't change our FACO tip. It should be more like Elizabeth Taylor. He changed her husband eight times, so at least. Uh... This, this Good one. <laughs> this is a question for our previous uh, study, which they did. Used instrument. Used instrument, yeah. Yes, sir. Just a question for everybody. Is there any uh, description given by the company? Is there any advice given by the company how long you can use a phragmatome needle? Not to my knowledge. No, phragmatome needle is not disposable. It is cutter, but knowledge. not phragmatome needle. Uh, function degrades over a period of time, so the phaco surgeons keep on changing the tip after so many cases. I know there's no prescribed, but uh, that they assess with the ability of the uh, fra fragmentation, how how far, how good is it, how it's... Much more than its ability, we're worried about it breaking like this. So we would like to know, is there any, any sort of uh, recommendation by the company that should not use it beyond six months or like, no? no it's a good idea. I, uh, after thought, I was looking at the probe and is there any crack or anything which we can identify before we put the probe inside? something which we may have to look at. There is something which would have happened, otherwise it's not easy for it to break inside. Okay, any pointers at the time of tuning the probe? They look at the uh, video, you said a lot of uh, abrasions were seen on the uh, 
giving of the phago fragment down. Sometimes you touch the phago fragment during the process of fragmentation with your light pipe, the hard instrument is going to damage it more when it's vibrating. So when it's in suction mode, you can touch it, but when it's vibrating, if you touch it with the light pipe, it's going to harm it, I mean, damage it. Basically, something which is vibrating at a very high frequency and this is a freak thing which can just happen. So I don't think there's any study which says you can use it a hundred times or a thousand times or it's, as, as Gopal says, I think. Even if you tested it mechanically, I think it could still break if it was destined to break. <laughs> Maybe we have a comment from Dr. Sauro. So we'll go ahead first and then I'll take. Okay, let's Sauro. Add a couple. Can you have the mic on, please? That mic. Hello, hello. Yeah, I think. So I had a couple of such uh, incidences, uh, not in FECO frag, but with FECO. And the reason I found out that many times this uh, FECO tip bends uh, while, uh, you know, autoclaving or sterilization and the staff makes it straight again. And that's when, you know, there is a small crack because, and that's the only uh, time when it can actually break. Otherwise, uh, even like this skill, it will not just break uh, without any hand. Maybe it's a good idea to look what at. What would have happened is, nurse didn't look at the shaft. You are under microscope, so you don't even see that inside the eye. See that probably there is a pen there and... Maybe we need to look at carefully look. before you putting it inside under the microscope and see if there are any signs of damage or anything and before we do it. Um, just, just clean the thing. I have had a uh, 85 gauge because we reuse everything. Uh, soft tipped... Uh, so I think... Like again, like I said, reuse the instruments. I think that article that and it's very common, like Dr. Sarah said, it's very common. Be very careful if you go inside, put it outside, and then go inside the eye over there. All the instruments you put it. Maybe we have a comment from sir. No, I, 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 and Rajiv, when did this happen? Happen. When? At which, which stage of the surgery? No, 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 which month? Last month, two months back. I had a no, last 2021. 2021. So, uh, twin lost, I lost. Broke that frag last month. Got the, the twin of that. You know, and everything. <laughs> it went in and it stood like a pole in the retina. Do it sometimes, you know. Got lucky. Yeah, I got lucky. It was like a pole. I could hang a flag on it and that kind of situation. But it was a fake frag. Uh, Dr. Pramod, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Because uh, what I was looking at, Rajiv, is a grade 4 nuclear sclerosis. Again, people phragmatome used to use some, like a breaking point. As you would know, like a very old microscope, and that is a point it will used to break if you get heated up. When you see early stage, you can see the fumes coming up. When a deep plug because of stage 4 grade, grade, uh, grade 4 nuclear sclerosis, probably that also would have had an extensive heat generated, and that's the point, melting point. Time. Just melt and just give away because of vibration plus added heat because arc tip and there's no enough circulation to pull it down. Probably that, I mean this is again hypothesis when you look at because initially the way you started, you can see those fumes coming up all around. The point uh, usually constructed outside the eye. Here it broke inside the eye. I had this of a 20. Uh, a break. And there was a fragment left in fact with the manufacturing problem because a 23 gauge cutter hole, the tip is actually molded separately onto the cutter. There is a joint, can't see, happens, and there is a stress fracture. What we should out Beko tip has got some sort of a manufacturing thing, it can break at a particular point. This is what we went back to Alcon and found out and they said that yes, that is how it is. That's an issue. To metal uh, friction, that's uh, a possibility. Cannula, that's, that's another. Cannula, metallic cannula with a small size uh, uh, 23 gauze uh, fragment. Not 20 gauge. 20, 20 sir. Not 23. 23, 23. 20. This was 20, used one was 20. Cannula. Yes sir, Pangar just a small tip. I lost twice soft tips of the soft tip cannula. And then I realized where we were going wrong in reuse, the sleeves had come forward and there is a catch which will prevent falling down of the tip. So if it has 
gone forward, then it will easily slip. Okay. Uh, any final final comment, sir? Now it is a foreign body inside. Any tips for the tips to remove it, sir, correctly? Like to add on, okay, Rajiv, your experience, like you will give some finer tips, like how you like to remove it safely. That is also equally important. Well, the reason I did not use any magnet there is because it's a hollow thing and if you hold it with the force. Uh, kind of normal retina, I might use a magnet to lift it up and still use the forceps. Not and easily go ahead, like just go ahead and hold it to the force. To get it. You hold it in a long axis and it's easier for you to get it out. Uh, so hold it against the long axis, that's a very important point because, and does it slip? It doesn't slip. Like to add? Uh, can I add a point here? I would think just to be doubly safe, I would possibly even the chandelier there and be ready for a bimanual. I was, my second thought was this, like, will you like to use a bimanual here now? Uh, so that even if comes a risk, less risk of dropping it. And secondly, always you are coming out, I think, make the sclerotomy yeah. even a little larger, larger. than uh, and really strictly necessary because it a little larger is not a problem. But if you again drop it, uh, you more trauma to the... I think those are two points which we... Absolutely can. agree, sir. Make sure that you don't, you know, hit the retina again. Uh, like to add something, Dr. Sarvanan? Okay. I th thank you so very much, Dr. Rajiv, for the wonderful case uh, and beautifully managed as well. <laughs> Big round of applause to you. We'll have our dynamic president, uh, Dr. N.S. Murlidhar, sir. And uh, he will be talking to us on infusion problems in vitrectomy. Don't panic. Thank you. Anoj and thanks uh, VRSI team for asking me to give this video. We, I'll just run through three videos, three different situations. Uh, each of them is just one minute. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? This was a, we were doing a 23 gauge vitrectomy and uh, suddenly I find that uh, the infusion is not flowing and then go to the next slide, please. Play the video. And we find that the infusion cannula has come off and you see the jet of uh, the fluid coming out like that. So what do we do? Don't panic. Remember in an MIVS, the greatest advantage is you have the other port. So you just put the uh, infusion cannula to the, uh, in the nasal uh, port and we open the infusion and we again put the cannula onto the trocar, the one that got dislodged onto the trocar and Keep the infusion running now because you want, you can't introduce the cannula in a soft eye and whether to use the same port or go for a different port, that depends. If the conjunctiva is very boggy and you are not able to find the, the original port, you may not be able to go through the same port. And if you are able to find the previous port, then go through the previous port, it's all right. But again, I am just reintroducing the uh, infusion cannula through that. Of course, before opening, make sure that the tip is inside and you know you are able to see the tip and open the cannula as, as soon as you have seen. So this is the way we manage this. Next slide, please. This was the patient in whom we were doing vitrectomy and uh, you know as we were doing vitrectomy I saw that there was a shallow choroidal detachment appearing in that quadrant. You can see that there is a slight elevation of the choroid happening there as we are doing the vitrectomy and uh, this was something that immediately we noticed that it's increasing and immediately we stopped the vitrectomy, we clamped the infusion and turned the microscope on and had a look and uh, definitely there was, uh, see you can see it increasing. So now we made, you know, we looked at the infusion again, lo and behold you did have the tissues covering the infusion cannula, although we had checked it before, maybe it had just moved back a little during surgery or something like that and we went ahead and cleaned the tissues and uh, we continued with the surgery. And uh, since the detachment was very limited and shallow in the periphery, we did not really have to do any drainage of this suprachoroidal infusion. So it's important to recognize any elevation like that that happens during your surgery 
you know, so that you recognize it in an early stage and before you have infused a large amount of fluid into the suprachoroidal space, stop and then address the issue. Last, the last case is uh, we are doing vitrectomy in this patient with RD and uh, suddenly we find that the eye is a little soft and the, the balloons are increasing in size and uh, realize that the infusion cannula is not you know in its place and it's gone subretinal and again we went and we cleared the tissues and continued with vitrectomy and but as we were doing vitrectomy we can see that there are you know the balloons there in the same area and the vitreous is probably there was a dialysis there in the in the same area where the infusion was present and because the fluid was going through the dialysis the rd would not you know come down and we were uh, forced to go ahead do some more vitrectomy around that infusion pod as you can see here there is a dialysis there and we had to do some more vitrectomy make sure that the vitreous is released completely in that region you know before uh, uh, we could uh, really continue and then because of the ballooning rd i injected pfcl to flatten the retina you know completely and again complete the vitrectomy around the infusion port you know this, this is where you may have to use pfcl also to prevent the uh, subretinal uh, you know the fluid going into the subretinal space and causing more detachment because the dialysis happens to be right at the infusion port. So infusion problems are not uncommon in your vitrectomy, but when it happens, don't panic. You can manage them as long as you recognize and address it you know, early part itself. Thank you. Thank you so very much, sir, for bringing out <coughs> the wonderful scenarios of this most common problems. I think, uh, especially faced by the budding surgeons as well. Start with Dr. Cyrus, sir, for what comments on this? We've already had all the solutions given very nicely by Dr. Modi. I think basically one just has to be always mindful of this, the fact that this can happen. And as you said, recognize it early. And, and uh, sometimes you may even have, uh, for example, if there's a parse planar detachment and, and you didn't uh, recognize it early, you may even have the cannula subretinal. Yes, in certain situations, you may even have to uh, either you have to take it out and, and put a fresh one more anterior or in a different quadrant or if it's already a situation where you know that you, there are going to be breaks and you're going to use silicone oil, then you could even make a retinotomy in that area to see that the cannula is well within its cavity. LG, sir. Just two, two points I'd like to make. One is that uh, as we are operating initially, probably the tip may be inside. As we are operating, two things can happen. One is you move the eyelid, eyeball, keeps bumping against the eyelid in a narrow palpebral fissure that tends to redirect the cannula in such a way that it becomes more and more tangential to the eyeball. At one point of time, it tends to slip into supracorridal space or subretinal space as the case may be. That's for one reason why. And also the second is some, the, the, the infusion cannula can become more and more loose from the eye highly myopic way with sclera is not holding on to the cannula very tightly then one point one point, point of time it slips into supracoral space there are two reasons why i always put two tapes not one tape the cannula to be taped against the tape and then initial point where we anchor it should make sure that it is not kinked it's exactly in the direction in which it should be you anchor it one point then choroidal bulge when it occurs initially uh, it sort of quickly tends to stop the infusion because the, the cannula is kinked, obstructed, if the cannula is obstructed tissue there, whether vitreous or bulging retina, because the infusion is stopped suddenly, the hypotonic quickly becomes worse, then the bulge becomes much worse. Second thing is I want to share with you one experience of a, a case where I had done a fluid gas exchange, now I have to inject an oil. The stage at which I was in is a highly myopic eye. And so happened that the vision cannula slipped out because my assistant's finger touched the cannula and the cannula slipped out. So he quickly put back the infusion cannula. Okay. Now, the minute he put back the infusion cannula, I just put my eyes to the microscope and I found the entire retina is behind the lens. 
and there was of course uh, supracoral hemorrhage as well so i had to uh, re redo the surgery in general what happened was the air was still flowing when the flowing air when he put the infusion cannula in sort of dissected the supracoral space and subretinal space rather than allowing going into the vitreous cavity so the thing is that you must pinch the infusion put it inside make sure it's inside and then reopen it not introduce it the air is flowing on the full pulse sir <clears throat> let's hear from dr sarvanand so like when sir was pointing out the first case when it slips out rather than using the same port because now it is loose in re-entering through the same port it's better to use a new port new site because otherwise the repeat triplication happen similar uh, what lg sir told i had a case of high myopia where it slipped again reduced there was a boop and the whole choroid closed it became a closed funnel but luckily uh, it's subsided over a period of four to five days and i had to had uh, did re-surgery but only my concern was that it will cause a embolism and cause uh, elsewhere was my only fear i was i was not worried about losing there i was worried about more about the life of the patient luckily nothing happened for that patient and i was able to get 69 vision that the only no hemorrhage cd only air was in the supracoral space i am a patient actually i actually put the what you said they put the infusion now into the other port it went back but then only i could actually assess the damage otherwise the retina was it was going. totally it was closer i could see the choroid in the, uh, the pekic patient it was uh, right under the lens knew that it happened i didn't touch anything and i left it Last case, I feel uh, like in this retinal dialysis in a young patient where the vitreous is very turbid, uh, the, the, the the flow may not be directed. What I was saying is that the tip is in the uh, space between the posterior capsule and the uh, anterior hyoid phase. That's either the canal of Petit or the Garnier space. Here, the fluid flows around in a donut shape and enters into this dialysis, which is much more easier to enter. Even though the flow is not directed towards the tear itself, because the point the pointing is like this. Even though the flow may not be directly di directed towards the dialysis, because of the arrangement of the uh, petit or the Garnier space, so it tends to go into the dialysis. Not the the, the tear is behind the vitreous base; it doesn't happen. But when the tear is in the anterior to the vitreous base, it's dialysis. Very common because the misdirection of the cases flow into the subretinal space. So you have to cut the rupture the anterior phase by doing a nice vitrectomy around the infusion port. The only thing about reintroducing the cannula through the same versus putting a new port. When you put through a new port, the old port may leak a little bit, and that may cause a little bogginess. So I, that I was the only thing that uh, you know that you may have to be little careful about. You may have to just keep some pressure over there and see that the that sclerotomy see. You know, uh, so I, I would just at the, once you've done all these fancy moves and done everything back, open the retina, have a suture that sclerotomy. If it is leaking, you could do that. You yes, are you always using our instruments, and I think it's leaked. Even if it's, my point is, multiple entries out, boggy, conjunctiva, some leak is still there because you said that. I think best to switch those, switch those down. I have a comment from Dr. Uh, Padmaji. I had an instance where a uh, fellow was doing SOR and he just called, uh, I just saw right now. In the, in the end, he said that uh, want to avoid the leaking, that means that just you can do partial uh, air exchange. Then what we saw was just right now behind the lens. And uh, we said, said anything related to, I think the air has gone behind the thing and we just closed it. One to two percent, the whole supracoral air responded and the retina is attached. So, happened, but air embolism is a possible risk. Has it all comes with the reuse of the cannula. May, may I share my the MIV system, inherent uh, the defects of the MIV system. We used to see this very, very commonly in the uh, Tontiga Jira, all these are all uh, because of the MIVS. MIVS. I, I wouldn't say it's due to full instrument. A complication happened to me, happened in Singapore. I think it's reusable. <laughs> okay. okay. may, may I share one case? Yes, can you do it? Okay. Mine is a different case, uh, one experience of mine in last six months. Clearly it was in a SOR case. We always have a habit of uh, sticking our cannulas with very firm tips. And in SR cases, as the bag pulls, the drape, it, the cannula along with it. So I have an experience that actually the cannula not moving there in the posterior segment, but actually broke through the zonules and came anteriorly. What I saw is sudden deepening of the IOL, uh, so deepening of the, I realized what's going on. Uh, I could salvage the situation, remove the cannula, put it in proper place, ultimately ended up subluxation of intraocular length. But yes, it can come forward also. And can get a IL drop or subluxing. Agree, good point. Uh, we have a lot of questions for you from audience, sir. Just summarizing it, shifting to a six millimeter cannula, is it a better option uh, once infusion related problem starts? 
I would use a 6 mm cannula if there is a pre existing choroidal detachment or a parsthena detachment. I would definitely use a 6 mm cannula, but once you have had to take out the infusion, if the choroidal, choroidals are not there, yes. it's not necessary. You, can, you could use a 6 mm cannula, but if the, if the situation demands it, but I wouldn't use it all the time. Yes. And the second question is related to your choroidal detachment case, whether it was from a misdirection of fluid or it was misdirection of the cannula. I think the choroidal detachment was suprachoroidal infusion, it was suprachoroidal infusion only. So the cannula had slipped out and then it just, you know, it had gone into the suprachoroidal space causing a choroidal detachment, not a retinal detachment. Retinal detachment. Thank you so very much, sir. We so have one a lot small of... Doubt. Small doubt. Yes, please, quickly. Is, is there any indication for to drain the suprachoroidal air in with... Not I mean, possible, it's not possible. Not, not possible. possible and not advisable also, I think. Any comments, sir, to drain suprachoroidal air? Yeah, often the same sclerotomy it can be squeezed out to some extent. But do you really need it? No, no, do you really need it? The, to squeeze out the air, something has to go into the vitreous cavity. When, no, when no, they have I'm a close. I'm not saying that you are going to do it that time. After you have re established the usual communication into the vitreous okay. cavity, then you can use gentle pressure, it can come out. A small bit of air is okay, but when the whole CD is closed, I don't think it is possible. I don't, uh, and I don't think it is required also, sir. Do you think it is required? No, no, the case the which I is the risk of air embolism. It is a yeah. significant risk for the life. It can happen. The case Wait for some time. It Just with the open sclerotomy itself, it can start draining, you know. It will not come out. Unless, the, unless you have something going inside and reforming the globe, the air is not going to come you out. You have to cause yeah. positive pressure. Yes. By infusing air from the, another sclerotomy, which you are sure goes inside the vitreous cavity, then it will come out, come out by itself actually because of the positive pressure. That's what I am saying. The small areas which are trapped. Okay. Uh, thank you so very much, sir. We will go to the next presentation. Dr. Thank you. Dr. Divya Balakrishnan, please. Uh, she will be talking to us on TRD. Could uh, this have been uh, salvage? Before Divya starts her presentation, Dr. Rajiv Reddy, we have a lot of questions for you. Just one question. Uh, how to enlarge the sclerotomy site, whether horizontally or perpendicular to the limbus? For any foreign body case. Maybe one second. Friends and radio sclerotomy. Reason why I extended perpendicular because I my first sclerotomy was actually a vulvar entry. That's the reason why I enlarged in perpendicular. Otherwise, I would enlarge parallel to the limbus. Thank you, Dr. Divya, please. At the outset, I would like to thank VRSI for giving me. I'll be showing two videos of patients whom I had to operate on my consecutive. It was the first case, a right eye uh, uh, PRD with a highly vascularized uh, of fibrovascular prolif. And uh, the patient, I uh, gave anti of prior to surgery, but the patient was lost to follow up because of uh, COVID and he presented uh, a month later. I took up him for surgery. I tried a truncation, but the peripheral vitreous was very gel like and there was no PVD. So I tried to uh, start dissection from the peripapillary, so called peripapillary area, because I could not differentiate where the exact dislocation. So I was happy getting a plane around uh, using a bimanual dissection. But there was a lot of oozing which was happening while doing the dissection, maybe because the anti of uh, the patient had received uh, a month before. And uh, the peripheral retina, in fact, in the initial optos picture, if you had noticed, was attached. But when the patient presented for surgery, you could see that the peripheral retina was also detached. Maybe the anti of could have uh, caused a peripheral uh, detachment again. So I could uh, complete the dissection around the arcade but when I went to the disc area, it was so adherent, I could not lift the membrane from the disc. So I tried it again uh, using cutter, uh, scissors with forceps. And this, uh, in the uh, video, you noticed that there was a break, which likely was a pre-existing one, because I could see that that area of uh, that retina was thin. I tried all modalities to pull out the uh, membrane from the disc. Finally, I gave up. I thought I'll do a fluid or exchange and see. But then, it did not settle, then the, I had to extend and finally this was the picture where the entire thing became a closed funnel kind of posterior. 
So this patient, again the next consecutive OT, I had to operate this left eye. And uh, so this time I was very particular that I should be dissecting from the disc area, I should pull out the membrane from the disc uh, before it uh, start bleeding and I get, I lose the view of the posterior fundus. I was very uh, particular about that because many a times we tend to move around in an area where the uh, dissection is very easy and we tend to uh, reach the toughest area and by the time the patient becomes little uncooperative and uh, the view becomes very hazy. So in this case I was very particular that I dissect from the disc area and move to the periphery. So this I could uh, manage with this. And the peripheral dissection, this was a very uh, thick adherent membrane in the periphery. There were two breaks superiorly which was diathermized and a fluid fluid exchange was done. So this is the poster fundus picture of the second patient. So uh, the first pa uh, patient, uh, whether the anti of could have been repeated or if I had done anything different in the dissection, if I could have salvaged this. In fact, I felt bad after seeing the patient poster because at least he was having a peripheral vision when I started the, the surgery or before I gave anti of and I lost that eye. Want the Thank you, Divya, for uh, bringing out uh, some of the challenging cases and beautifully managed, I will say, uh, especially the other eye. Start with Dr. Cyrus, sir. Uh, thank you. It's a uh, very nicely done dissection. Uh, but I think uh, one thing which I felt you have been a little more particular about is I was noticing as you were doing the dissection, there was a lot of blood accumulating. And I think that is something which we shouldn't allow because uh, this blood then forms an comes like another membrane and sometimes this becomes more difficult to dissect and and very adherent and you can cause a lot of breaks when you're trying to remove blood. I think try and see that when the starts catch it early and and do the hemostasis uh, very meticulously as you're proceeding because that will the long term it will save a lot of time and cause less trauma. The other thing is about uh, starting from the disc or from the periphery. I think that has to be decided. I mean, we can't have any predetermined uh, sort of plan uh, or, or be hard and fast uh, rule about it. So I think if you can find a plane in the periphery uh, and, and sort of separate the peripheral hyaloid, uh, then uh, it's the way I normally like to do it. Uh, then proceed towards the posterior pole because the bleeding again tends to be in fact less if you're doing it that way. Uh, but sometimes you just can't find that plane and in that case then lifting it from the disc, then once you lifted it from the disc, there's some particular quadrant you can find a track leading to the periphery and uh, from there then you start working circumferentially around. I think those are the in which one can uh, these are the, and and it was a very tough case i think challenging case challenging. sir what did that, sir uh, divya i think uh, the first case you operated one month after the anti i think that's the key to the whole thing because one month later the the probably the plane would have probably gone more fibrosis would have occurred the ideal time is within seven to eight days like we all do up three two four five six seven days so I wonder why that is the reason why you had the difficulty because of the long gap between the injection and the surgery. That you could not she remove the membrane. mentioned that that was so, but she couldn't help it because patient yeah. because of COVID, he, he could not not come, come for no, it. But something you have to handle. You know, so this once he said that he could not remove the membrane. What was the issue? He could not visualize, or it was so tough he could not pull it out. Things one as sir mentioned because of the ooze, it was very difficult to identify the exact. Uh, in. And second thing, when we when I hold it with the forceps, it was not coming only. Very adherent. Well, I mean, it's very unusual to get a, such a tough membrane. Uh, but I, I feel that uh, because of the blood, you're not able to get the correct exactly. plane. That should have been more. But sudden done, this is a really difficult case. Uh, when it can happen to anybody, it's a very difficult. Case. When that happens, when yeah, there are situations where you feel that the, uh, it's so tight that you you're worried that you may create an evulsion. Uh, there, if you what I'm saying is, so in, those in cases that you case, can you can maybe go it may around it. Layer, but I you, feel it was more of a visualization issue rather than the okay, removal okay. issue. That's what Otherwise, you can then go around it. 
circumcise it around the disc and then find your plane so that you don't necessarily have to pull the thing off the disc. Uh, so the membrane around the disc was removed but uh, like little closed posterior. So unless I remove that membrane from the center it was not kind of opening up. So that was sometimes a bubble of LPFC there shut down. Some cases sometimes. Another. So for some time you can leave it want to use as many second instrument as possible. LG sir, please, uh, your comments. I wanted to say that one thing, the fact that you did not risk the beginning the cause for the failure. It's problem of the strong attachment to the disc, I understand that. Because at the end of the surgery, you could not. Now, could you have gone back again in second or third day, attempted to peel, but what all it needed was of the tissue and the disc and the retina would have got reattached nicely despite the big break right so maybe you could have gone in again because you could not see properly because of the bleeding one attempt you didn't succeed go on third day by which time bleeding would stop and you can remove the clots and go back in by manually as what cyrus said if you cannot pull it off the disc yes you dissect it as much close to the disc as you can that can relieve the traction enough to reattach the retina it need not be a lost case that's what i'm trying to say in this case, in this scenario, what tamponade you will use, sir, to close the case initially on table? What? No, no. You, you are only trying to buy time. It's not a tamponade. Yeah, so you which can leave it fluid filled. You can leave it air filled. Doesn't matter. Then after three, three, three days, you are going to reoperate. What does it matter? What you leave it with? It doesn't matter. Really. I have a comment. Uh, very well, actually. Very tough case, and you did a good job. Only one uh, tip is that uh, see when you have a break, which when it is small. I would suggest that don't remove the subretinal fluid because the subretinal fluid is there which is very viscous because of the long standing TRD it's a very viscous and it is supporting the retina from below so you are able to you know remove the membranes from top the moment you remove the subretinal fluid and the, your irrigating fluid goes inside the retina becomes very mobile then it becomes even more difficult to do the surgery because your blood is also all uh, coagulated blood is stuck to the retina very difficult to remove the blood and the membrane one uh, tip is not to remove the subretinal fluid early. Thank you, ma'am. Point is that uh, whether you start from the periphery or from the center doesn't make a big difference. Right? Even LG, LG said pointed out, not like just because you don't start from the disc, you had a failure. There are other issues at play here. Because I thought like it was a close uh, near the disc. So <laughs> the sometimes when you pull it from the disc and starts out. bleeding heavily, then yeah. then also you can lose the case. Doesn't make actually in these sub cases it's better to go from outside in rather than from inside. Leavage was easier from outside. Yes, that's, that's, that's the way to go. I thought you started off rightly, but somehow we ended up in problems in between. Shali, ma'am, you wanted to say something? First, I wanted to congratulate Divya for bringing this up in a forum. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. It needs guts. Uh, I, uh, what I wanted to say, LG sir already said, I don't think a residual traction at the disc will cause the air, like you had a break which was mid-peripheral, and the air went through that. So to me, if you have decided that you want to go to exchange, I would keep my subretinal cannula there, aspirate the soft tip with the fluid-fluid exchange before, before going on to the air. So with the fluid-fluid exchange, you will realize very much how much retina is going back. If it is not going back, then you pay attention. Uh, but I think he said it rightly that, uh, you know, you just uh, trim it around the disc and come back. But uh, well done, Divya, I wanted to congratulate you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have a couple of questions from audience. Role of PFCL to control bleeding in diabetic vitrectomy. She will not control the bleeding. So, so let's rephrase the questions when you have a diabetic bit on the uh, diabetic bit or bleed on the table as pointed out by Cyrus sir. How will you like to clear it up? First of all, what he said is to identify uh, and cauterize it at the same time itself. And uh, again, in that particular case, if it's, a, if it's a lot of heme over there and you are trying to, it's a sheet formed over there, keep LPFC on the other side and again with the uh, soft tip try and take it off first. Don't pull it with the fluid itself, you end up creating multiple breaks. I, I don't know. I personally haven't found LPFC to be particularly useful at all. So I not really think of it really as an effective hemostatic agent. And uh, so the usual things, I think, one is 
elevating the bottle for some time that usually takes care of it and uh, the other thing is uh, by manually again that's very useful when you can localize the bleeder with your fluid actually see the point which is oozing and then cauterize it uh, so surface bleeder sometimes respond well to a continuous uh, the laser also on the continuous mode can coagulate that with the uh, laser beam uh, sometimes the pressure of the uh, cutter tip at also for example if it's be close to this or sometimes even on the disc you can uh, sit there for some time patiently mild pressure with the cutter and and that sometimes so all these are the little things which you can combinations do. of everything yeah. the problem is all these little things work when the little things are away from the from the disc what about a bleed from the disc and you've tried all these things tried the 60 mm pressure for one minute it didn't work you tried it for the second time a third time you you press the thing manually it didn't work now what would you do don't worry so much about a bleed and it kept on at the most first post of day is going to have hemorrhage at the most you may have to do a vitreous lavage no on the yes. table on the table every 5 minutes it collects the at the entire posterior pole you take remove you remove it it goes away it's liquid but you but it's not going away and I, and you've tried it for half now i'm giving you a practical situation i've gone through it i won't tell you what i did but i'm asking you what would you do as a take home message you will be, be generous to let the audience know what you did sir okay now i'll tell you something i had actually found nothing and i've tried p i tried pfcl the whole periphery got blood i had to remove that so i finally i decided to to keep it at 60 mm pressure let it ooze from the disc did an air fluid exchange at that time let the ooze continue and put it on silicone oil and then i knew that is still oozing and still close the eye with that with normal pressure the next day the blood was much more it had covered the posterior pole let it stay in a prone position i waited two weeks in the two weeks the peripheral blood because it was covering the entire surface between the retina and the uh, and the silicone oil and then slowly that started absorbing but then some parts of it started clotting so two weeks later i went in i used in silicone oil as my infusion and under silicone oil because there was a lot of blood still there i cleared all that blood with uh, uh, with the flute needle and then the last part there were some organized clots where the previous stocks were the membranes had formed now i removed the silicone oil removed those membranes and um, this time i left that small clot on the disc i did not touch that clot and close the eye the patient's okay she's 60 million sir uh, sir not 60 i have one patient even 80 pressure it was still losing okay sir particularly patient with a nephropathy we always have a difficulty just to come on that what i do sometime is no need to rise too much because we have other issues if we increase too much and already ischemic retina i do a gently the cutter always having a tip is blunt i gently just touch it over the blues but not pressing too much you have to ensure that you are not pressing too much because you don't do cannot cannot do cautery you cannot do anything so gently holding that that mechanically just vessel just closing it wait for a while and eventually it stops on its own hmm? yeah sir <laughs> uh hey. ha, uh just had a doubt here i think we i, I would even go up uh, why are we stopping at 60 and 80 because i think uh, a short time i instead of doing it repeatedly at 60 i, I there are these situations where right but i have gone 100 and 110 also and and for a limited period and and for okay. you do it for 2 minutes and then bring it down Sometimes it comes. So you, you you can say it that as a way. Anyway, it's oozing, so you are sure that circulation is not compromised, right? Okay, so, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much, Divya. Okay. Uh, ha has anybody stained the ILM over the disc? Yes, sir. You want to say something? Ha has anybody stained the ILM over the disc in these situations? In the I. Uh, yeah, ILM. ILM uh, put okay. blue and stain the ILM, or or at least try to stain the disc. Has anybody tried that? There is yeah, no but, ILM uh, on the disc. But when yeah, it's losing so, so much, how are you going to no, have a time to, to build the ILM? No, he wants to know whether he can put the ILM on the disc to control the bleed. 
No, no, no. Uh, what I meant is, can we stain with the blue and see what happens when there is an extra ooze like this, which is not stopping. I am not talking there about so the much ooze which is covering the disc, so there is no question of staining it. Uh, sir, uh, there are situations where it is kept on which oozing a little bit and it's not stopping. So I don't think there is ILM on the disc. So, so there is no question of doing ILM from the disc. If you are trying to use the the stain, the BBG as a uh, as something that will cause a clotting. Probably a better thing which somebody has suggested to me once also is tricot. A few crystals of tricot can sometimes do it. In this case, I forgot to do it. Okay, I think we'll continue with the Manish's talk at the similar lines. Uh, he will be talking on recurrent vitreous hemorrhage post diabetic wit. Uh, over to you, Manish, please. Uh, and is it audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah audible. Please go ahead. Uh, so I'll be uh, talking about a similar case. This was a patient, uh, a 38 year old male patient, more than eight years of diabetes. He did not, he was not on any anticoagulants for IHD. He had undergone PRP in the right eye and uh, vitrectomy in the left eye uh, for PDR uh, noted. And uh, he was having non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage uh, in the right eye. And uh, his BCVA uh, was one minute. Uh, Intraoperatively, there were extensive membranes and non-resolving hemorrhage. So after doing truncation, I, I was not getting a uh, hold, so I lifted the membrane from the disc and there it started bleeding. Then uh, while I was removing uh, the second membranes for the uh, proliferation, the hemorrhage kept on increasing uh, throughout. Uh, so I tried to give mechanical pressure with aspiration scraper tip, which is hard tip. and uh, even after that, there was some amount of ooze, so I tried to inject EVD, uh, OVD on the optic nerve head for stopping it. Uh, so the hemorrhage kind of uh, came under control and it did not really worsen while uh, doing the membra uh, membrane dissection, uh, subsequent membrane dissection. Also, the pressure was kept at 60 for some time. I made sure that I was doing the base excision and removing peripheral uh, vitreous. Uh, under fluid as well as under air as we get more view uh, while doing the uh, peripheral dissection under air. I restarted the fluid and removed the clot and it looked uh, as though I didn't really uh, avulse it from the tip of the uh, from, from the disc but just trimmed the clot and uh, look the picture looked pretty clear uh, on table. But next day the patient had persistent vitreous hemorrhage. I thought that since I had done membrane dissection completely, I thought that it might be from the disc and it should resolve over a period of time. But there was no improvement for four months. The patient had gone out of the town for some time. So I took him up for resurgery, and at this time I did uh, a FACO. And uh, so this was uh, FACO with, with there was no glow at that time for, for while doing FACO. Uh, and then uh, lens was implanted and after IOL implantation there was a lot of vitreous which was there just posterior to the capsule uh, so that was trimmed the peripheral vitreous which was there in the, uh, in the in the sulcus was trimmed I made sure that I'm removing all the vitreous with depression and uh, then add uh, laser was added and uh, fluid air exchange was uh, ILM was peeled uh, so then after doing laser, the case was closed. So patient eventually had 6 by 12 vision with pseudophaky and clear cornea. Uh, so my uh, question is what went wrong? What was, this, what was the source of uh, hemorrhage? Was it from the disc bleed that just continued or was it the HFVP that probably developed over a period of time? In this case, as we, I saw that there was a lot of vitreous, uh, a lot of uh, hemorrhage in anterior vitreous and the peripheral vitreous. So, by doing lavage without doing phacoemulsification, would that would have been adequate, or uh, should we be doing uh, lens, uh, sacrificing lens and putting IOL before uh, in such a scenario? So, these are my questions for the wise counsel. Yes, there was uh, no obvious other source of bleeding intraoperatively. What I felt was the disc bleeding, once the clot lies in the post operative, it could have opened up. But that's the most obvious uh, answer to the first question. Also, in fact, it depends. Sometimes if there's a dense uh, blood coating the anti phase, anterior vitreous, 
feel that it is normally we with suction you can strip the blood to the periphery and show that is a, there is adequate visibility to complete your surgery. Feel that you can take the decision on table. Lens is already fakey and clear. You can try to strip the anterior hyaloid uh, towards the periphery by gutter uh, suction. That is not working. Then you can try uh, do that. Also by doing a forced hydration of the anterior chamber, inject uh, uh, cases into the anterior chamber forcefully, close through the zonules and loosens up the anterior vitreous space, and stripping becomes a little bit more easy. Post hydration and stripping, and if that, that does not work, we can reserve echo to the last resort to take care of this. So about the uh, uh, disc hemorrhage, my question is that can it bleed for four months? Can it have recurrent hemorrhage for four yes, months sir. from such a kick patient? The blood takes a long time to clear from the vitreous space. That went wrong. First question. Okay. But what went wrong? Nothing went wrong. And the second thing is that we bleed after a diabetic vitrectomy is very, very common with or without uh, from the disc on the table. It's not necessary that the disc has to move. The humpty number of points from which it can move. You remove the membranes from across the retina in addition to the disc. Just because the disc was the source of resistant wounds on the table does not mean it cannot bleed after surgery from some other source. It is, it is difficult to identify from where it bled, or should we break our head from where it bled. I don't think that, that is required in an eye where you have done an excellent job of seeing all the parietal membranes. Second time when you are operating, should we remove the cataract? Perhaps yes, because the cataract will definitely develop over a period of time. Even if you cannot, even if you can clear the vitreous very well, there is some amount of cataract, maybe you can combine it. But I don't think that is uh, something which is very important to, to decide upon. Something with the individual patient basis, you can decide. Uh, so, sir, my question is because if we have to do cataract and do rectomy, that's a much more elaborate procedure than uh, doing OPD FG kind of with. Uh, I would probably so, sort of shy away from these OPD FGs for recurrent hemorrhages. But all, I would probably go in and do a vitreous lavage because you can easily add more laser after OPD FG. It is either here or there. There's still some residual blood. Then you have pushed the vitreous base, the air. Sometimes you can cause again a new break at the edge of the chest base and you can't do laser immediately. Immediately after the FG, if the air absorbs, again there can be re So I would go in and do a vitreous lavage, shy away from OPD FG for recurrent vitreous hemorrhages. It's a different matter for a RD with a recurrent RD. What of Senator? Uh, uh, Elisa, the ILM peeling, uh, Manish, why? So there, was, there was some amount of crumpling of uh, okay. the ILM that I saw that on table. For visual That's purposes, I agree. Hey, uh, yeah, Manoj, I uh, just uh, wanted to uh, make yes. one point about the disc hemorrhage, uh, more from the, about the previous case. Uh, if you are having this, uh, you know, repeated uh, hemorrhage from the disc, I think apart from going on to 60, it's important to do 60 millimeters with air. Then that a, your clarity improves and the effect of air tamponading down is much more better than saline down. And it also, there is a coagulation effect immediately as the air comes in contact with the blood. That is one thing which helps me very fast. There was another question about PFCL. If you put PF, first of all, PFCL doesn't stop hemostasis. Second thing is when you have so much of, uh, you know, bleed over the surface, you never know if there are small slit tears. You can very easily have PFCL going on inside. Method. Subretinal, that's an absolute nightmare. And it's a mess then. And on similar lines, one last question for you. Maybe you can only answer, Dr. Anand. Cold in use of cold infusion when you encounter such a situation. I, I, I've never used and I've never so found that to be useful at all. So I think we are not to use use all. All. So, Okay, Cyrus, sir, comments on... Uh, no, I think it was wonderfully managed. As said, you did everything right. There's really nothing problem with that. Only thing you mentioned, source of the bleed, whether it could have been anterior hyaloidal proliferation. I don't think so. The way this case went and the way the things went subsequently, I think it was somewhere from the surface, as you said, from disc or elsewhere. And it's not that it's continuously oozing. I mean, it could have been a bleed and then that was not absorbing. I think it was absolutely fully managed. AD, ma'am. So what happens, uh, Manish, when you are operating under very high infusion pressure, the bleeders are controlled, bleeders are quiet. And you, when you are closing the case, you feel that, okay, everything is nice. So, but then later on, post-operative period, when the pressure is low, it, it will bleed. So what is advisable is that just before you close the eye, reduce the infusion pressure, make it low, and just look for any bleeders. So allow the bleeders to come up. Then, then you can see the bleeders and cauterize the bleeders. So that will give a more complete, uh, you know, uh, hemostasis for your case.
uh, should we be actually going lower than yeah. our uh, routine 25 30 millimeters um, that depends if you reduce it to 30 millimeters and see whether you can see any bleeders if not maybe reduce it one further and look for any bleeders which appear if they appear then cauterize then again go back to 30 and close the case okay uh, thank you so may much manish uh, may I? any role of uh, again injecting anti wage up at the end of the surgery uh, I think that will be a separate debate altogether. <laughs> <laughs> we will be not give a served lunch if we overshoot the time. Thank you so much, Manish. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Let's have another intraoperative complication, but none other than Jyoti Vyas. Uh, he will be talking to us about intraoperative vascular occlusion. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank VRSI for the opportunity and uh, for the previous speakers who are making me feel belittled already before starting the presentation. I'll be presenting a case on intraoperative retinal vein occlusion. Uh, it was a patient of a 62 year old male uh, referred from another center post cataract surgery for a posteriorly dislocated lens uh, following a uh, PC rent. Uh, the uh, primary surgeon had informed that there was a cortical matter with a few nuclear remnants which were present. The patient was a known case of hypertension, 15 years on regular treatment with no other systemic complications, uh, diseases like diabetes, cardiac uh, pathology, nephropathy, or any history of glaucoma whatsoever. Uh, during the surgery, uh, we could see that the primary the corneal, uh, the section was uh, nicely sutured. There were sutures placed at the phaco wound, and the air was holding. There was no intraocular, uh, no preoperatively, there was no hypotony. We tried to clear the cortical matter and the uh, vitreous along with it in the retropupillary plane. Uh, there was a striate, uh, striate uh, keratopathy of around 2 plus and as we went in, although the view on the screen would not be very uh, clear, but intraoperatively we were able to appreciate all the things which were there which had to be removed, although not much of nucleus was there, it was mainly cortical matter which had to be removed and small chunks of the uh, nucleus could be removed easily with the cutter itself. Uh, after that, uh, since we were trying, we, we were already in, we just wanted to complete the vitrectomy and uh, just for that we wanted to have a clearer view of the, uh, from the uh, surgeon's perspective. We just want, uh, went and scraped the corneal epithelium. That. Pass forward a little bit. Just a routine video. We scraped the corneal epithelium and uh, since most of it had been done and we were also uh, just as we go in to a surprise this is what we are met with a full blown intraocular uh, central retinal vein occlusion like picture congested disc hemorrhages all around but this did not deter us from a further step which we wanted to do so we inject a tricot finish off the duction of the PVD and uh, finish off the case. Uh, leaving it only under air, not really doing anything for the central retinal vein occlusion. So my, uh, this is uh, most of the surgery for it. And uh, the only thing is what really went wrong, I was uh, for the want of a better question, what else could have been done or should we have we left it the way it was? We have a management of surgical retina as well as medical retina here. Okay. Let's start with LG, sir. Problem is with the patient, he chose the wrong time to get occluded. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Can't re relate anything to venous occlusion occurring. Maybe a hypotony induced. Quite, you see, post trabeculectomy as well, sir. Uh, patchy areas of vein occlusions happening. Not the way he is shown. Not the this, uh, we, I have seen this happening during a FACO fragmentation using the FACO probe when your suction is too much and there is interoperative collapse. Due. This used to happen more with the Untiga Jira, I have seen this. Not like typical CRO, the hemorrhages are much more deeper. Which is, I, I feel it's because of the constant change in pressure during the surgery. That's what it I was only, that it was is. That is only scraping the epithelium, not the entire cornea. Yes. No, in yes, between yes, something, yes. no, not something in between, when, when, because it's an open cannula. It was open cannula, before the time when he was trying to plug it, I think there must have been a drop in pressure somewhere, somewhere, somehow. 
Because it's not common, it's not common, but I used to see this more than Tontiga Jira, where the ports were all open and using high suction. Very less we see in MIVS, only one case I have seen, but usually the visual prognosis is very good. After three, four months, they'll become totally yes, normal. Sir, actually, you were very right on that. This patient, we did not do anything after FAE on the second post-op visit when he had come. Uh, the vision had improved with the uh, AFA correction they had put it and the patient improved to somewhere around 64 without any treatment and the hemorrhages were seen to be reducing. This is not, I don't think it's a typical CR word, it's more related to the hypotony right, and the hemorrhages are much more deeper than what you right, would see sir, in a right, CR. Sir, the only thing which was going against the etiology and the occurrence of this thing was there was no use of phragmatome, there was no evolving uh, hypotony on table, there was no choroidal scene, uh, there was no uh, misalignment or the of the uh, prolonged hypotony. I'm just talking about the ex ex momentary hypotony. Excursions in the IOP. Just a momentary hypotony. Both the ports to put the plug in. It's not a walled cannula. You're using yes, non walled cannula. Wall. The, both the 23 gauge, when the, both the ports are open, you can have a sudden drop in pressure and it could happen. Not like the prolonged hypotony. It's like a transient drop and uh, up and down. Uh. Anything you'd like to add, Cyrus, sir? Sir, uh, just a question. Yes, sir. Uh, was the patient a high hypometrope? Uh, because high hypometropes, when they have closed angle glaucomas, they undergo surgery. They really don't. They, they end up with post op uh, CRVO. That's because of the narrow optic canal that they have. Hey, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, I'd like to. correction was, uh, so this was patient was lost. Uh, it was around 8. 8. Plus 10. 8. 8. Hypermetrop. Uh, this case maybe at the end could have left the track out over there. <laughs> for the even to go down. Yes, sir. <laughs> the medical management part of it. Okay, uh, thank you, Jyoti, for the wonderful case uh, presentation. Uh, maybe move on to uh, last but not the least, Dr. Vaishali, ma'am. Uh, she will be talking to us on complicated surgeries with 27 gauge. Can I have? Oh, thank you. Thank you, VRSI, for this very kind opportunity. Uh, can I have my? Lights there? Lights, please. It's through my laptop, but yeah, perfect. Uh, it's an Alcon sponsored talk, but I don't have any financial disclosures. Coming on to 27G, uh, there are multiple indications where you can do. So I'm going to tackle first three because the other ones are mostly hybrid. Now, let's talk about complex diabetic vitrectomy. What do you want? You want the right instruments, fluid based, flow limiting. You want the ability to work very close to the retina. And you would want the segmentation and delamination using single instruments, probably. And you don't want to change them too frequently. So let's look at some of the videos that 27G offers to us. One, you can do most of the things using the same instrument without a need to change the instruments. You can go on very high cut rate, which reduces the surge and reduces the pulsatile vitreous traction. That is what the problem is with 25G. Now here you can see the conformal delamination. Now this is what is using the port up approach you can use the same cutter whereby you are segmenting and the same instrument can be used to delaminate and to remove the membranes flush from the surface of the retina uh, not only that when you come to very firm adhesions which are on the surface of the retina in diabetic vitrectomy you can see many a times you want to use fold back delamination. The fold back delamination has an advantage because your cutter is behind the edge of the ERM. So ERM is folding back into the port and ERM is kind of protecting the retina. Now, if you want to do the conformational sideways, you can do that as well. Uh, Pet peripheral is always a problem, not only in diabetic, but in vasculitic TRDs as well. And manipulating the scissors in the mid periphery, especially if it is nasal, is not easy because there is not much you can do to 
change the conformity of the scissors to the conformity of the retina. Now here you can see you have these beautiful forceps which you can just give a nudge to lift this small edge and then the cutter can be insinuated very close to the retina in the space between the retina and these epiretinal membranes and cut them flush from the surface of the retina because these cutters you really do not leave need to leave those small stumps of the uh, tissues that we used to leave long time ago. Similarly, if you are going close to uh, find the space, you can use proportional reflux very effectively, which helps in elevating these membranes from the surface of the retina. And after that, of course, you can see you can cut them very easily. You can do the forceps a nudge if you want and uh, it can be cut flushed not only from the periphery but from the surface. Now this is the uh, pre and this is the post-op of the same patient uh, which I just showed. Uh, the nodes. The nodes in the diabetic can be a problem and especially if you are a beginner and you are using the large cage that is where you can end up with the iatrogenic breaks or you can leave a lot of nodes behind. But this one actually gives you a precision to uh, enter the node and remove it from the surface of the retina. By manual, they were showed a beautiful video and uh, by manual dissection, if you want to use, uh, you can use of course the scissors, but uh, with 27G, honestly, you don't have to go to buy manual very often. But if you want to go, you can hold uh, forceps and you can actually use your cutter as a scissor. So this is what uh, you can uh, do to dissect those membranes. And the cutter gives you an advantage of using the proportional reflux, efflux of the fluid and creating that space which is much better, much safer, rather than cutting it very close to the detached retina. Uh, coming to the PVD, PVD in diabetics especially is not really what we do, but many patients with TPHM, if you want to do, now 27G PVD induction actually has a better ability to engage the vitreous here the retina, so if you are sure there are no nodes, it's just the TPHM or the epiretinal membranes that you are managing, uh, you can actually use this very effectively. Removing uh, not only the cutter, the 27G sharp skin forceps really allows you to get that grip of the membrane very beautifully and you can see here is the taut posterior hyaloid membrane which you want to remove from the surface. So after the initial vitrectomy, you can hold it close to it. It has an excellent grip and you can remove it from the surface of the retina very, very closely. So now from diabetic, let's, uh, sorry, this is again uh, the last in the diabetic. Uh, just to Combine whatever I have shown all in one video. Starting from the disc, we are using the cutter just to create the plane from where to enter. You can use the same cutter to segment, the same cutter for delamination, and this 3D mode allows high cut rate, low aspiration, peripheral shaving, less breaks. There is a common myth that uh, if you are doing core vitrectomy, you need to reduce the cut rate. Honestly not. You can do a very good core, just increase the aspiration without increasing, uh, without decreasing the cut rate. And it, you can see here, the membrane is very diffuse on the surface, but you can actually change the direction of the cutter. And this is what I love. The maneuverability, the single instrument, uh, like you can see, you want to go obliquely, you want to go ports up, you want to go sideways. You do not need a second instrument. 
PD in diabetics, Dr. LG said, and everybody that you have to take care of them as and when the ooze is happening, as you can see, the small ooze. With cut, uh, this is the fo uh, laser, continuous laser for the superficial one, which Dr. Cyrus was talking about. You can use it very effectively. But the one advantage which it offers is that you don't have to remove the cutter and put the another instrument to aspirate the blood because all of us, you know, we feel sometimes lazy. With 27G, you, can, you actually do not need to aspirate uh, other than the cutter. You can use the same cutter, glow close to the surface of the retina, aspirate all the loose blood which is on the surface. And most of these patients, if you don't create an nitrogenic break, you don't need a tamponade. So there is no question of which tamponade. Switching gears. Complicated surgeries are not about the surgeon. They are also about the patients. So I'm going to show you a couple of uveitic surgeries. This is a 62-year-old, cloudiness of vision. Vision is good but autofluorescence is not good. There is suspicion of vitreoretinal lymphoma out there. Now, these are the kind of the patients you don't want to use a bigger gauge because you want to be minimally invasive and lean. Very important is cut rate should be very, I was told 12 minutes by the way. So, cut rate should be very low and the aspiration should be high because you don't want to damage these. Cells. Always remember, if you are doing vitrectomy for lymphoma, move away from the site which has the vitreous aggregates because the malignant cells will not form aggregates. So malignant cells are non-adherent, so they will be somewhere in the clear vitreous, so make sure to take that vitreous along with you. And this is the patient, uh, not only the diagnosis, but uh, not only the vitrectomy, but the diagnosis is important. So this is uh, lymphoma, actually. And this is a young girl, the next patient of mine. This is a young girl. She is a 25-year-old girl who is referred to me from South India. She has a peripheral uh, vascular glaucoma, not responding to steroids. Everything has been done and you want to do a combined surgery because of the complicated cataract and all. So once they have put in the IOL, it's very easy to go in with 27G because it doesn't cause that much distortion. And you can complete the surgery. This is the undiluted sample under the air. Your globe doesn't collapse. You can collect as much sample as you want, which is very important and then uh, complete the surgery, and this is the post-op. Uh, she actually was a rifampicin-resistant patient, and she responded to anti-TB drugs post-vitrectomy. Acute retinal necrosis, we had a lot of discussion yesterday. So uh, this is the patient who actually developed in a very acute phase, very fast detachment. There was lots and lots of active retinitis, but we could not hold the surgery any longer. So you can see, clearing the vitreous, necrotic retina down there, uh, you do, it does have a tendency to come in. This is the vitreous which is very adherent now. So you have to kind of, uh, you know, assess risk-benefit ratio of whether you want to separate it. But even if there is a skirt in the mid-periphery, leave it, go ahead, do a good vitrectomy, and you can see the active retinitis lesions, and this is the sieve-like retina. Now, these are the patients who are going to have hypotony in the face. You want everything controlled, and you want the smaller gauge. However, in ARN, you may have to, you have to use silicon oil, so the last port may have to be changed. And this is the post-op of this patient with ARN, my last patient. In oncology practice, now this is a young girl who comes with retinal detachment and we saw something which we suspected could be retinocytoma with retinal detachment and this is what she looked like. Well, so we thought we will go with minimally invasive 27G and we did put topexican 2.5 milligram in the solution becomes green 
So we went in, brand new set. And being a uveitis person, I wanted to aspirate these for histology and the cutter gets blocked. So my sis, uh, you know, nurse kept on trying, pushing the fluid and ringer to open it up, but it just won't open it. So I had to use another cutter. Deliberately decided to stay away from these calcific spots or whatever they were, and to complete my surgery even without coming close to this area because I did not want another cutter to be blocked. Bubbles is another issue which actually do not bother you much, but uh, you know, you have to be aware that sometimes when you go on a very high cut rate, the bubbles can come, but you can work actually very close to the surface of the retina, to the breaks, the hyaloid which is there, you have a control over the situation, you can flush, you can use, you know, this is the other break that she had in the periphery. And very interestingly, I was waiting for the vitreous to turn green, and it did not turn green. And then Atul, uh, my fellow who's with me all the time, he's the one, so he said that if you look at the calisto, it's turning green. But in ingenuity, that is taking care of the color. So while I was operating, I did not see the green vitreous. So this subset shows the green on the traditional, and the top one is ingenuity. So that's uh, uh, how it is to conclude 27G PPV makes complex surgery. We are all learning, but it seems like the future. Thanks to my teachers for teaching and thanks to my students, all the wonderful people for, you know, trying the new tricks in the surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for the fascinating videos ma'am and teaching as always you know you're a master of all these things and you. you're still learning the way 27 is going to go thank you uh, uh Ira, sir you want to add something your experience with 27 thank you vishali i think the wonderful videos and bringing an entire spectrum <coughs> of uh visions i think 27 gauge is uh, the future yeah. well i wouldn't say it's the future but i think it's an the addition to our armamentarium and I think in situations where uh, it, it do there are certain in the, the gauge itself the small gauge as uh, Vishali pointed out but the the ability to do things unimanually which you would otherwise sometimes require by manual for and getting into planes uh, so and the cutter being even closer to the, the tip cutter I think all those are advantages and uh, only thing is one thing is the cost because uh, cost may not be that much more uh, compared to 25 gauge. But, but they then, can't be reused. Yeah, so they it, can't, you can't that's reuse the it so I think yeah. it becomes really one time use and, and that that increases the cost quite a bit. Want to add something sir, LG sir? Exactly what I wanted to say, I mean there's absolutely no doubt it's got tremendous use and value except that if they are in a reuse where you cannot reuse it, it becomes a problem. Uh, thank you so very much, ma'am. And uh, with this, we conclude the session. I request all the wise counsel and the presenters uh, to come on the stage to click a picture. It has been requested by the scientific committee.